I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we continue our investigation into the Darley Routier case. everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett and I'm joined as always with my scintillating co-host Alice. Scintillating? It's like quite the opposite. I I could not be more unscintillating <laughs> right now after a long hard day at work and then wrestling my children to bed tonight. <laughs> Whatever Alice, we know the truth. We know the truth. You're always put together. You're never frazzled. Uh, right. Oh, that's that's you know that for a fact. That's not true because you're my coworker. <laughs> I've seen your Instagram page, and everything on Instagram is true. And right? Instagram it totally is reflects true. life. True. This is this is true. Very true. Hey, I'm really excited. This is not an ad placement. I just am loving my straw strawberry bubbly. Have you had this flavor? I have not had strawberry. It's I am currently so drinking good. lime. Mm. Bubbly. See, like very classic, but you know, sometimes when mm-hmm. you go off the you know, beaten path, it's not good. But this is really good. This is not an ad placement. I just really like strawberry bubble. I like their mango a lot. Mango is very good. So is their blackberry. Yeah. Really, they're very good. They're very good. They're very good. Bubbly, if you're listening and you want to pay us to say this, we will. <laughs> but we are telling the truth. We, we do love bubbly. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> I think everyone already knows that I have a bubble water collection i guess is what it's having a i have an obsession with liquid with fizz in it i don't know why because it's I just, delicious it is delicious it's the best it's the best anyway anyway <laughs> sorry <laughs> we haven't talked to each other for so long because know, brett so life long. has just been a roller coaster for you but yet you always are chipper and you always find adjectives for me i know i try despite the ongoing roller coaster of life but just to update everybody, things are things are going well. Baby boy is getting stronger every day, and you know, and we're blessed. And thank you guys for continuing to pray for us as we as we struggle through to hopefully achieve normalcy sometime soon. But in the meantime, we're talking about Darley Routier, and we've done two episodes on her on this very controversial case, and there's so much more to talk about. So. I think we've probably had enough chit-chat. Let's dive into the case. Last week, we were pretty tough on Darlie and her story. So I wanted to start out with a couple things that people point to as evidence in Darlie's favor. One of which I think is probably a little overstated. And the other one might be the best piece of evidence for her. The first is the blood on the knife. Now, we've talked about this before. The knife contained Darlie's blood. And it contained Damon's blood, but it actually didn't have any blood from Devin, or at least none of their blood was found on the knife. And this has led some to speculate that there was a second knife involved. And maybe that points to a second intruder. But this is another one of those pieces of evidence that's a little bit overstated in this case. First, it's not the case that there was no blood from Devin on the knife. In reality, we just don't know. As testified to at trial, the forensics expert only tested four swabs of blood from the knife, not the whole knife. So it's not as if this person had the whole knife and tested it from you know tip to, to the end of the knife. If the swab wasn't from where Devin's blood was located, it goes without saying, it wouldn't show up on the test. And that's what was testified to at trial and there was also testimony from one of the experts that the injuries on Devin were consistent with the knife from the kitchen. I think the other thing about this is Devin was probably stabbed first before Damon and Darley, so it's actually not hard to believe 
that his blood would not be present on the knife. He could sort of imagine that the stabbing of the other two would sort of wipe his blood off if he was the one who was stabbed first. So not as maybe interesting as some people want to make it out. Moreover, this is sort of used as an example of maybe there were two intruders. Darley only testified to one person. Um, I think this is probably an attempt to tie in those two guys we talked about earlier, but I would just reiterate that Darley's description of the person who was in her home doesn't actually match the description of those two people. Plus, as little evidence as there is of an intruder, it's hard to believe the more people you add, the more intruders you multiply. We saw this in the Jeffrey McDonald case. Really, the harder it becomes to believe this story. It doesn't really make sense that one of the intruders would bring his own knife and the other person would grab a kitchen knife. So I think most likely if there were an intruder, there was one. They used one knife and it's this kitchen knife. Hey, but why is this typical for um, if an entire knife is covered in blood that they would only test four swabs of blood from around the knife? Or nowadays, would they test, you know, the entire knife or more swabs was this a failure of the mps or the prosecution's testing i mean i don't know if it is or not i think typically four swabs they probably felt they were going to get everything i think this is one of those things where they felt pretty confident this was the knife it probably would have been overkill to examine this knife more this is the knife that darley said the intruder used it's the knife that she found on the floor it's covered in blood the boys all have stab wounds that are consistent with his knife. So yeah, you know, in a perfect world with unlimited time and unlimited, and unlimited resources, maybe you would want to test this entire knife. And obviously, since they didn't, it's now become sort of a a point in Darley's favor. But I don't really consider it a failure of anyone not to go that extra mile and test the whole knife. Yeah, and that was kind of a setup for you, Brett, because I can imagine that's the obvious um, next question for anyone. Why not test the whole knife? We see this all the time in our drug cases and DNA cases. It's kind of not practical to test every single fiber found on, say, a shirt. And so you do the best you can. And for example, if you find 10 bags of what looks like cocaine, you don't actually test all 10 bags typically um, because you can kind of do different types of tests to see whether they have the same consistency and you have confirmation tests of certain bags. But, um, you know, DNA, blood, drugs, those all degrade typically when you test them. There actually is new technology where um, DNA can... I think not be degraded as much. But in other words, they're not infinite test subjects. You can't just keep testing them. The subject that you're testing actually gets worn away and evaporated um, into whatever they do to test them. That's part of the reason why you take swabs and you don't do every single bit of it is it actually degrades the entire, it degrades what you're testing. And that's actually one of the reasons, and this is kind of an aside, but sometimes you'll see that the state is opposing DNA testing that some inmate wants to have on some piece of evidence. So one of the reasons the state will sometimes do that is that, as Alice said, once you test it, it's destroyed. You can never test it again. So sometimes if there's not a lot of DNA sort of erring on the side of caution, let's wait until the technology is better and we don't have to destroy the entire sample is one of the reasons they'll sometimes oppose that. But yeah, I mean, one of the jobs of prosecutors, really, and police officers and technicians and everybody, is balancing the need for evidence versus the time and the resources you have available. This is sort of the CSI effect where people just expect, well, their DNA testing was done and fingerprint testing was done, and defense attorneys are pretty good at using this. I mean, they'll use things like, well, you didn't test all the cocaine, so how do you know the whole thing was cocaine? Or well, okay, the gun was found on him, but did you check it for fingerprints? And the answer is no, we didn't check it for fingerprints. It was found on him, but it's something that a defense attorney can point to and say, see, they didn't even test it for fingerprints. Oh, we get that all the time. <laughs> we get that all and the time. And by the way, because of the way guns are made, just as a side note, it's really hard to get any prints of value. That means identifiable prints, because if, if, you, if you can imagine what a gun looks like, there's lots of ridges on it, like kind of tiny, tiny, I guess, checker board pattern, which makes fingerprints really hard to kind of stay on in a way where you can identify the unique identifier. And so that's actually one of the reasons guns are printing guns is not um, fingerprinting guns is not always the highest value um, use for your limited resources. 
And DNA is another, and we're going to talk about this some in this case, DNA and fingerprints, you'll often find unknown, unsourced DNA and fingerprints at a crime scene. And this is something that, you know, your defense is always going to point to because you're going to say, well, how do we know who's, whose DNA is that? But DNA and fingerprints are all over your home. They're all over your car. They're everywhere. And just because there's DNA in a crime scene doesn't mean that DNA is actually connected to the crime scene. And, and you actually see that a lot. So nothing's ever as clear cut as it may seem. And as, as some people want to make it seem in a lot of these cases. Brett, before we move on, I got to say, I kind of got away with not shaving my legs as frequently when I was holed up at home, but time to get friendly with my razor again. Because for me, summertime means shaving more often, and there's no better razor out there than the Athena Club razor. Honestly, shaving used to be something I dreaded, but my kids love the pool, which means I really got to step up my shaving game. And Athena Club's products make it more fun and easier to shave. Not only is it the prettiest razor I've ever seen, but it's gentle on my skin, leaving it moisturized, super smooth, and bump free. And I love that it has its little magnetic holder, so I always have a place to put it in my shower. Yeah, Alice, I think my wife has benefited from Athena Club's support of our show more than anybody, and you can understand why. Athena Club's razor is designed with built-in skin guards to help prevent razor burn while being gentle on curves. It's no wonder their razor has thousands of five-star reviews. Plus, you'll never have to worry about running out of refills or being stuck with dull, overused razors. You can choose how often replacement blades ship to you for free. That means fresh, ready-to-use razors always arrive right when you need them. And Athena Club also has the dreamiest shave foam that will leave your skin soft, hydrated, and smooth. And Brett, the best part is the razor kit is only $9 and comes with two blade heads, a magnetic hook for shower storage, and your choice of handle color. So show your skin you care with the Athena Club Razor Kit. Sign up today and you'll get 20% off your first order. Just go to athenaclub.com and use promo code OWLS. That's A-T-H-E-N-A-C-L-U-B dot com with promo code OWLS for 20% off. One of the things that Darley points to that I think is probably one of the most interesting, one of the most powerful points she makes, and something that her defense focused on a good bit at trial, is the fact that the cuts to her body would have been made by her non-dominant hand. Darley had experts who testified that this was very unusual, that if people are going to cause injuries to themselves, typically they will use their dominant hand. It's sort of just a natural thing. If you're going to cut yourself, you're going to use your dominant hand. Darley was right-handed. The cuts, if she did them to herself, would have been uh, applied by her left hand. And this is one of those things that either has weight with you or it doesn't. It's either one of those things that is really convincing to you or it's not. Part of it is just a question, how smart do you think Darley was? How well do you think she planned this crime? If she did it, there's obviously some dumb things that she did that make you wonder whether she's some sort of criminal mastermind or not, but it doesn't mean she didn't think of certain things. For instance, she's if she did this, she's thought of the sock. This is something pretty clever that she's done. She's thought of the need to inflict some wounds on herself and frankly she's thought of how important it is that those wounds are serious unlike jeffrey mcdonald who applied some wounds to himself but were very very minor she at least you know she went for the jugular as it were and so the question you have to ask yourself is wouldn't she think of using her non-dominant hand to further this illusion that she's been attacked and that's not unheard of uh, in fact, we know one really good example of this is people who are attempting to disguise their handwriting. They will often use their non-dominant hand for that purpose. There's even people who think that happened in the Jean Benet Ramsey case that if Patsy Ramsey wrote the letter, that she actually used her other hand in an attempt to disguise her handwriting. So if Darley did this to herself, it's possible that she thought of the same thing. And I think... If you think she did it to herself, I have a theory about how it would have gone down. I think it makes sense that the last thing she would have done 
is to cut her throat. That's the most serious injury. That's the last thing you're going to want to do if you want to survive this. Because you know it's going to be dangerous. Even if you're attempting to not cut your arteries, you know this is a big step. So I think that's the last thing she would do, which means that the superficial injury she has to her arm would have been self-inflicted first. So she has some cuts on her right arm. These are also superficial. People often say that the cuts went to her bone, but as was testified to at trial, the reason for that is because where she was cut, I mean, you know, put your hand on your wrist, for instance. You feel your bone? You didn't have to cut very far to, uh, <laughs> to cut down to your bone. So she's got these injuries on her right hand, which makes sense because being a smart person, she would know if you're defending yourself, you're going to throw your dominant hand in front of you. So she would have cut that hand with her left hand. So she started off doing this with her left hand. It doesn't really surprise me that she would then continue and finish with the same hand, the left hand, the uninjured arm to do this very delicate thing. I mean, she's cutting her throat. She's already injured her right hand. Maybe she didn't even think about that when she started off doing this. But at that point, use your left hand. Don't use your right hand. Interesting. Well, you know, we've talked about DNA and we talked a little bit about fingerprints. Let's talk about if there's any evidence of an intruder. So there are three unidentified fingerprints, one located in the family room and two on the utility room door. These fingerprints have never been identified. Other than that, there's no evidence that anyone else was in the house with Routier. How significant are these three unidentified fingerprints? So we've kind of already tipped our hand here with our previous conversation. Frankly, probably not that significant. Honestly, it's not unusual to find unidentified fingerprints and DNA at a crime scene. Because unless you're a hermit, people tend to be in and out of their houses and have people over even one time, you know, someone delivering a package, neighbors dropping off things, kids, friends coming over. Crime scenes are just not sterile environments. In fact, testimony elicited at trial indicated that the fingerprint nearest to the crime was likely a child, but it was too incomplete to actually match with anyone. So if I had to guess, it's probably one of the boys, but too smudged to actually make out who the fingerprint belongs to. Now, although some experts have said it was a child's fingerprint, others have said it was more consistent with an adult female. Even if Darley's story is true, the fingerprint could very well just belong to her, and it's too smudged for them to make a positive identification. So if it were the case that that fingerprint belonged to the murderer, that means that at some point, at least, this intruder wasn't wearing gloves or a, a sock as a glove. So you'd expect to see many, many more fingerprints all over the home or on the murder weapon than this kind of one smudged fingerprint. But that's just not what we see. So the fact that we only have three unidentified fingerprints, I actually think is unusual. I would expect to find more unidentified fingerprints that don't have anything to do with the murderer. If you think any of these are belonging to the murderer, it's very strange. He was so careless to take his glove off at one point and leave just one fingerprint. That seems unlikely. Yeah, you have to believe that he somehow avoided leaving any fingerprints or really even any evidence of his existence while he was entering the home, while he was getting the, the kitchen knife out of the block, while he was attacking Darley, attacking the kids. Like you said, he's either wearing a glove and then he takes it off for some reason, which doesn't really make any sense. The, none of his fingerprints are found on the kitchen knife. And I just don't I don't think Darley picking up the knife is the reason that you wouldn't see any fingerprints at all or even any smudge identify, unidentified fingerprints. So you have to believe he's really smart on the one hand and really dumb on the other. And that's the thing I never really get about some of this stuff. It's one thing if it's DNA. I mean, you can't help but leave DNA. But it, you see one fingerprint here you can't identify, and all of a sudden that means it's the intruders who didn't leave any evidence otherwise of his existence. Probably not. It's probably just somebody else's fingerprint. In this case, it's probably either Darley or the kids. Smudged fingerprints happen all the time. 
You know, that's the other thing. And this kind of sort of goes back to the CSI effect. People just expect that if you find a fingerprint, it's this perfect fingerprint with these perfect ridges and it's so beautiful. And you put it on that fancy CSI machine, the computer, and it reads the fingerprint and tells you exactly who it is because everybody's fingerprints are in the database in CSI. And in reality, that's just not, that's not true. Usually you're getting partial fingerprints. You're getting smudged fingerprints. Every now and then you get that perfect, wonderful fingerprint, but not usually. The other kind of print that you don't see in this case are shoe prints. There are no bloody shoe prints in the home. There are no shoe prints outside. There's no indication of someone walking through this very bloody scene. The only footprints you see are Darley's bare footprints. If someone else did this, they walked through the home without leaving any trace of their presence. And it's hard to understand how Darley would be leaving footprints, but this person would not. One interesting thing that people have brought up is not something inside the house, inside the home, but outside the home. There was testimony, including by Darley, that there was a black car that had been parked outside her house the day of the murder, and that Helena Zabin, the laundry woman, had told her that she had seen a man peeking into her garage. Now, Helena would testify that she had seen some black cars in the neighborhood that they bothered her because they were always speeding up and down the roads. She said that there were two men in the black car that she saw. Now, Darley would claim on the witness stand that she was with Helena when the black car was in the alley behind the house, but Helena would testify that she had never mentioned the cars to Darley and had never been with her when she saw one of these cars. So this is sort of a, you got to wonder what exactly is happening here there were other neighbors who also claimed to have seen this black car driving around, but that's about it. There's no make, there's no model, there's no license plate. This car was obviously never located. Darley testifies about this in her testimony. It really kind of blows this, this, this black car up. The black car was close to the house on the day of the murders that she saw people peeking into her garage, and she points to Helena to back her up on this, but she doesn't actually do that, so... Little unclear about what's going on here. I think this is just going to depend on how you fall in this case. If you think the evidence points to Darley, then you think she's heard people talking about this black car and she decides to include it in her story and really amplify it and try and tie it into what happened to her. If you think, you know, there was an intruder, then you probably think this black car is significant. Though once again, Helena says she sees two people in this black car. There's only one intruder, or at least Darley only sees one intruder. Yeah, a lot of that, when you when you kind of put that together, it looks like a lot of grasping at straws, and people are also very suggestible if there's been any reporting about black cars, or people try to reach into their memories of what could have gone wrong, trying to make sense of something after the fact. And I can imagine if it's a car they hadn't seen before, people will just remember to, to talk about it. Yeah, there's that old saying about, I think, Chekhov, Maybe it was Chekhov who said this. Correct me if that's not Chekhov. That if there's a gun in the first scene or the first act, it has to go off in the second act. And that's not how life works. Everything in a movie has a place in the movie. If somebody says something at the beginning of the movie that seems a little out of place, it's because that's going to come up later on, right? That's the way stories work. And sometimes people see crimes as if they were fictional stories. So if there's a black car in the neighborhood, well, the black car is related. If there were people down the block, you know, scoping out a house at three o'clock in the morning and maybe trying to break in, well, they must be related to this crime. And in reality, as we all know, I mean, life, all sorts of stuff is going on in life and some of it matters and some of it's not. Some of it's a coincidence and some of it's connected. So it's hard to say exactly what's going on with this black car. I think what you have to do is you have to put it in the context of the rest of the evidence. If at the end of the day, you come to the conclusion that there was likely an intruder involved in this case, then I think the black car starts to take on more importance for you. What I don't think the black car does is prove that there was an intruder because we just don't know enough about it. Right. There's a huge gap missing in between, especially just the fact that there's no specificity to this black car. Now, the most damning testimony regarding the intruder theory was given by James Cron, a consultant for local law enforcement and crime scene analysis, and he made some interesting points. Start with the supposed point of entry. 
the cut window in the garage. It has been said before that the police relied solely on the fact that the dust around the window wasn't disturbed to say that there was no intruder. But later demonstrations showed that it was possible to step through the window without disturbing the dust. But that's not the whole story. Here's what Kron actually testified to, and we are going to read to you the back and forth testimony. Question. Did you have a chance to look at the windowsill? Yes. Did you have a chance to examine it for evidence of blood? I did. And did you see any blood on the windowsill there at the window? No. It had a fairly thick layer of dust over the entire windowsill. How about the items over there close to the window? Did you look at them also for evidence of blood? Yes, I did from head height down. Any evidence of any blood on any items close to the window? No. Okay, when you were looking at this area, the windowsill portion of this window, what types of things were you looking for? His answer, signs of an intruder going through it, disturbed dust, footprints, blood, any outside debris that might have been carried in through the clothing or shoes of the intruder, such as bark, mulch, any type of damp vegetation, just any signs that an entry and exit would, was made through the window, foreign material and disturbed areas. Question, sir, did you find any scuff marks or shoe prints, foreign material or any evidence whatsoever that an entry had been made either in or out of that window shown in States Exhibit Number 41A. No, there was a solid layer of dust along the entire length of the white window sill, and it was undisturbed. What do you mean undisturbed? There was no streaks through it, no signs of movement through it. It was an even layer. It's sort of like new fallen snow. It was obvious that nothing had gone through it. As you can see, it wasn't just the dust. It was the fact that there was no evidence at all of someone entering the home. So to say it was just dust not moving, that's not it. You can see how thorough this questioning was about examination from the head height down all around the window, not just the window sill. So sure, it's possible for someone to enter without disturbing the dust on the window sill, but why would he go through the trouble of being so careful? It's not like he's trying to hide his point of entry. Remember, he would have already cut through the screen with a knife, the knife from inside the house somehow cutting from the outside. So is he really going to step carefully through to avoid dust? Because I don't think the intruder would be thinking about forensic analysis of whether one dust has moved or not. This scene already suggests that someone is coming in through the window. So disturbing the dust doesn't really mess up that story. The story is someone's coming in through the window because of the slashed screen. Right. Yeah, there's no reason for him not to disturb things and not to have left some evidence behind people have done this they've done an experiment where they've gone through the window without disturbing anything but it's not exactly easy to do you can do it we'll put a picture of this window up on the website it's big enough to go through without touching anything but it's kind of low to the ground it would be a lot more work if it were me i would and i'm wearing gloves and i don't care I would have been disturbing things. Uh, there would not be an undisturbed layer of dust because I'm not going to go to the trouble of being so careful. Like Alice said, he's not trying to hide the fact he entered through this window. He's trying to hide his fingerprints, right? So that's that would be a reason there are no fingerprints on the, on the weapon because he's wearing gloves. He's trying to hide that. And maybe you say he's trying to hide, you know, any, any connection to the home. So that's why he throws down the, the sock and doesn't keep it with him. But this doesn't make any sense. He's not trying to hide this. So you have to believe that he entered through this window with no reason to to not disturb anything and yet managed not to. Just you can say lucky, but it's not even luck because it's not something that he was attempting to accomplish. And that's not it. There's actually no evidence at any of the other windows of which the house had many that anyone had considered them as a point of entry before choosing this one. People have speculated about why this person would have done this, and some people have speculated maybe they were looking through the other windows and they saw Darley lying on the couch and they thought, wow, there's an undefended woman. I'm going to break in and sexually assault her. And then they stumbled upon the boys and, you know, the murderous frenzy resulted. But if that were true, you would expect to see evidence of a person near the other 
windows and the police looked for that and they didn't see it. Nor was there any indication of attempted forced entry through the sliding glass doors in the back of the house, which is an obvious point of entry for any burglar. And Kron, who we just talked about, summed things up in a way that I think is important for these kind of cases. We often get hung up on one thing or another. You know, we're walking through this case and pieces of evidence over three or four episodes, and sometimes it makes you think, well, this is the really important thing, and they're trying to say she's guilty or she's not guilty because there's dust on the windowsill, and that's not it. This is a big picture case. Most cases are, and that's what you have to look at. And Cron says that, and I'll read you what he said. It's sort of a big picture. It's not any one thing. It was the overall scene, which primarily is the lack of evidence in many cases. But the entire scene indicated to me there had not been an intruder. There wasn't any one object or any one situation there. And, and this is compounded by the fact that there didn't seem to be a motive in this case. If this was a burglary, why didn't the killer steal the jewelry that was sitting on the kitchen counter? We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Murdering three people with a knife is a pretty bold move for any burglar, particularly one who doesn't actually steal anything. Moreover, if the burglar broke in, not realizing that there were three people in the living room, why not just turn around and leave at that point? Why go find a kitchen knife and then go on a rampage. There's no evidence that the boys woke up to see their killer. It appears they were attacked while still asleep, at least the first one. Leaving would also be consistent with the behavior of the two burglars that Mary Rickles testified to. We talked about them earlier. Pretty brazen guys. They tried to break into her house twice, but both times when she saw them, rather than kill her to prevent her from identifying them, they just left. And if the murder were intended instead to be a sexual assault, why wasn't Darley assaulted? Her story was the boys had already been stabbed when she was stabbed. If that's true, why didn't the person stab the boys, then attack Darley? He wouldn't have necessarily known there were other people upstairs. They certainly were not awakened at any point by his attack. And when he did attack Darley, why not finish her off? If he decided that all these people needed to die, why not ensure that she was dead? Her injuries, as we talked about last time, relatively light compared to what the boys suffered. And based on her story, the killer would have known that she was alive. She literally gets up and follows him. But instead of stabbing her again, he not only runs off, but he throws down the knife, the only weapon, apparently, that he has where she can pick it up and potentially use it against him. And he does this even while keeping this sock that we've talked about before that he had apparently possibly used as a glove. Why not throw that down too? Or better yet... Why not keep the knife to the coast is clear and then ditch the knife where you ditched the sock? You know, it doesn't make sense with him to have so brutally stabbed the boys. You know, it, it seems that at least maybe one of the boys required more than the initial stabs to be killed. That, you know, when Darley gets up after being sliced, that they wouldn't turn around and finish her off. It's not like they had any problems with finishing the murders. Right. I mean, these guys or this guy or whoever you think did it did not have any compunction about killing people. And like you said, based on the evidence, based on where Damon's body is found, probably stabbed him again once he had sort of crawled out of the area, and yet he doesn't finish off Darley. And then then we talked about this a little bit before, but the knife itself. Why are you using a knife in the home to commit these crimes? Not what, Why not bring one of your own? And it's even weirder than that, if you think about it. If the killer was an outsider... He did bring a knife that he used to cut open the screen. So why bring one knife to cut open the screen, but then creep through the house to the kitchen, silently remove another knife, and then use it to commit the crimes? Why not bring a weapon to confront whoever you find? What if you run into someone before you can find a weapon in the home? What then? So the combination of those two things is very strange to me. And given the fact that nothing was stolen, and given the fact that Darley wasn't assaulted, it's very difficult to figure out what the motive would have been to commit these murders. If the intruder didn't have a motive, did Darley? Would she kill her own children and why? I mean, this this is very sad, but at, at this time, it really had been a difficult time for Darley. It seems pretty clear she was suffering from postpartum depression after the birth of her youngest son, who was, I believe, seven months at this time. 
And only a few weeks before the murders, Darren found his wife writing a suicide note. She told him that she was depressed and she, quote, couldn't keep up with raising three sons. Darley also told a friend that she had attempted suicide less than a month before the murders. In her statement to the police, Darley said that the night of the murder, she'd felt depressed and told her husband about it that night. She said, quote, Since I had the baby, I have been having some depression. I told Darren I was depressed because I hadn't been able to take the boys anywhere because we only had one car. Now, the day before the boys were murdered, Routier's laundry woman, who we talked about earlier, Helena, related a time she had to take Drake, the baby, away from Darley because he was wrapped in multiple blankets and gasping for air. She said, quote, The face was very perspired, very red, and the lips were light blue. Very slowly, I uncovered the face, and then the baby started to catch his breath. Then the baby started to cry. And an interesting thing about this, she testified to this at trial in a hearing outside the presence of the jury. The defense had moved to suppress this testimony. So there's a rule, Rule 403, that basically says if something is more prejudicial than it is probative, you're going to keep it out because you don't want to prejudice the jury. This is also 404 evidence. We've talked about this before, other bad acts evidence. So you would have to tie this into the crime using 404B, and then you would have to convince the judge that it's not so prejudicial that it should come in. The judge actually kept this out. So people who think that Darley had an unfair trial, this is an instance in which the judge ruled in her favor, kept this out, did not allow it in, ruled that this potential attempt to kill the youngest child was not related enough to the actual crime to come in. I think that was probably the right decision just because Helena's testimony is certainly questionable what Darley was doing. It certainly leads you to think she might have been trying to harm the baby, but it's not 100% clear. It's a different method, so maybe good that it did not come in, but you know, we're not a court here, so we certainly can can consider this as we're thinking about what happened. Absolutely. And, you know, besides having to raise three boys and just having the hormones um, postpartum, there really were some hard times in the Routier household. You know, financial problems were plaguing the family. Their home was on the verge of foreclosure, and they were two months behind on the mortgage. They had $12,000 in credit card debt and owed $10,000 in back taxes. Only three days before the murders, they had been turned down for a loan. Now, Darley told a detective the day after the murders that she and Darren had argued about their finances and the boat they had purchased the night of the murders. Now, this was confirmed by statements made to a defense psychiatrist who testified that Darley had told her, quote, she was upset because his Jaguar had been breaking down all the time, and I guess what culminated it was that he had left it somewhere, and the man had called her and kind of been rude to her about having Darren come get the Jaguar. So she was aggravated because he didn't take care of the Jaguar, and she was having to deal with this man calling her up and being rude, while she had her kids and, you know, neighborhood kids and everybody in and out of the house. Also, she was upset because Darren was taking her Pathfinder, and that was leaving her and the kids stranded. Also, they had a boat. Something needed to be done because here they had this car that wasn't working too well, that was going to cost them money to fix, and here they had this boat that was not working, that was going to cost them money to fix, and both of these were kind of Darren's deal, and she wanted him to make a decision and get something done. You know, they argued back and forth. They argued. So we're not saying that this is necessarily the motive, but things were not placid at home and things were not calm for Darley herself. These, of course, are a lot of things, but I think what's so interesting is they are so close to the time of the murders. The fight about the boat, the being turned down for a loan just three days earlier, the fact that within the month preceding the murders, Darren had actually found Darley writing a suicide note, and she had mentioned on more than one occasion that she was depressed and had even tried to commit suicide within the month of these murders. Um, I think it's relevant because of how close in time to the murders these actions and feelings were being expressed. And I think a lot of times these cases where 
a parent is accused of killing children are particularly complicated. And sometimes we make the mistake of thinking a motive is a linear thing. So, well, if she did it for money, there's not enough, there's not enough life insurance on the kids. So why would she do it for money? I don't think it's going to be that. If Darley did this, it is a very complicated thing, a bunch of things really that would have come together to create sort of the perfect storm for her to commit this crime. And I think if you're thinking about it too literally, you're going to miss that. And you really do just have to look at everything that was going on in her life at the time. Barbara Jovel, who was one of Darley's friends who testified against her at trial, testified that Darley and Darren often argued about money. And all this was going on as Darren's business was slowing down, which meant that their fighting only increased. The day before the murders, Helena had come by the house to clean. Darley brought her jewelry down and put it on the kitchen counter where it actually would be found by police after the murder was finished. Darley showed this jewelry to Helena and told her that she needed $10,000. Helena was not in a position to make that kind of purchase, and the jewelry would remain on the counter, untouched by Helena, unsold by Darley, and unstolen by any intruder who came by. In fact, things had gotten so bad that Darren had discussed faking a burglary in order to commit insurance fraud to raise some money for the family. Some people have suggested that maybe this somehow led to the murders, but I think the opposite is probably more likely. If Darley did this, then she and Darren had already thought about how to fake a burglary, and when she needed to cover up the murder, she went to the plan that they had already considered. To continue this case's bizarre similarities to Jeffrey McDonald, Darley was also on diet pills at the time, finfluramine and fentermine, which are commonly known as finfin. These drugs were pulled off the market in 1997 because they cause serious heart problems. But they also had other side effects, including depression and something called fin rage, which is violent mood swings that often included irrational anger and violence. About 40% of patients experienced fin rage, with 3% going all the way to full-blown psychosis. Darley testified that these drugs had not affected her mood, for what it's worth, but family and friends would later report that Darley was emotionally abusive to the boys at this time, and she often cursed at them and yelled at them when they did even the smallest thing wrong. And this, At this point, Darley and Darren were also fighting not only about money, but about her weight, with one friend witnessing him call her a fat pig and telling her that if she didn't lose weight soon, he would find someone else. Woo, I will say, having kids just seven months postpartum, um, I think most women are still carrying some baby weight. So to be called a fat pig, probably, um, I think I would fall into a fen rage even not being on fen fen <laughs> if, so, if someone called me yeah. that um in other words it sounds like they did not have perhaps the greatest relationship and that there was certainly a lot of explosive dialogue between them you know it doesn't start at fat pig it probably escalates there and that type of language is probably what she uses uh, on the kids and what the kids hear as well and may emulate we're getting a fuller picture of the routier household you know, it, it is interesting to hear the, the similarity with Jeffrey McDonald and his use of diet pills or the, the fentramine, which is an upper. You know, that's how diet pills typically work. They they hype you up. So you're, uh, I guess when you're on caffeine and you're, you're hyped up, your appetite is suppressed. And you can imagine getting hyped up being, say, on caffeine pills. You can imagine how that would affect someone and how that can feed any sort of rage that you may be susceptible to feeling anyways. It's kind of like a, a heightener of those emotions. Now, let's look at Darley's behavior. We've saved this discussion for the end because it is what most people spend the majority of their time discussing when it comes to this case. Guilty or innocent, people have poured over every single thing that Darley did, every statement she made, every time she did or did not cry. And we wanted to cover all that evidence first. It's not that criminal behavior can't be helpful because it can be. The Behavioral Sciences Unit at the FBI is based on the idea that people tend to act certain ways when they commit a crime. You've heard us read those FBI behavioral profiles to you, and we think they are very helpful. But 
we present the following information with a caveat. Behavior does not trump evidence. Behavior doesn't make someone guilty when there's no evidence against them, but it also shouldn't acquit someone when the evidence is stacked to the ceiling. What behavior can do is help give context to the evidence, try to make sense of kind of the cold, hard facts. So with all that in mind, let's look at some of the things Darley did that night that are most interesting. Let's start with a 911 call. If you read the transcript, the only truly coherent moments in the call are when Darley is emphasizing the presence of another person at the home. In fact, her first words in the call are, quote, somebody came here. They broke in. She says this before she even mentions the fact that her boys have been stabbed. Later on, she says, quote, somebody came in while I was sleeping. Me and my little boys were sleeping downstairs. Some man came in, stabbed my babies, stabbed me. I woke up. I was fighting. She'll later dispute this and say she said she was frightened, by the way. And she continues, he ran out through the garage, threw the knife down. Now, at some point, the operator tells Darley not to touch anything, and she's sure to mention that she, quote, already touched it and picked it up, which, okay, she's responding to the operator, but then she doubles down later on saying, quote, his knife was laying, was lying there and I already picked it up. I bet if we could have gotten the prints, maybe, maybe, she kind of trails off. So it's like trying to create a defense or an explanation for why her prints are on things already. And I just want to say, people often point out the fact that it was the operator who first suggested her not to pick up anything. And then she says, well, I already picked up the knife. And people people will say, well, see, she's just responding to what the operator said. That is possible. It is interesting that she reiterates this later on and specifically says something about fingerprints. I would remind people of Chris Watts. Chris Watts, at some point, decided that his story was going to be that Shanann killed their kids and then in a rage, he killed her. He got that from the interrogator. The interrogator, while he was interrogating Chris Watts and while Chris Watts was denying that he had any involvement in the crime, mentioned other cases in which one parent killed the kids and in a rage, uh, the other parent killed them. And Chris Watts actually admitted later on that he hadn't even thought about that being a potential story until the detective mentioned it. So maybe she's just responding to what the operator said, or maybe the operator spurred something in her to realize, huh, that's a, that's a good point. I can mention that I picked up the knife and that's why there are no fingerprints on it. Now, when her husband arrives, it becomes even more apparent. Here are some of the things she says to him over the course of the call. Quote, I saw them, Darren, Came in here, Darren. I don't know who it was. We got to find out who it was. Somebody who did it intentionally walked in here and did it, Darren. But the weirdest thing about the call may be how long Darley stays on it. She's on the phone with 911 for nearly six minutes. When the police arrive, the 911 operator is begging her to go let them in the front door. But it's like she just can't get off the phone. The question I have to ask is why you've given the 911 operator the information, help is on the way, you keep saying your babies are bleeding to death, why are you not doing anything to help them? More often in our 911 calls, they actually cut off much sooner than the 911 operator would like because the person runs off to go try and help someone or try to do something about the situation because they're usually getting angry at the operator for being too slow. You know, there's usually, think back to Michael Peterson, the staircase, you know, send someone, hurry, 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 please. And he, then he stops talking and you, you kind of just hear him breathing. Here, it's Yeah, the people opposite. hang up on 911 operators all the, all the time. That's why they trace the calls, by the way, so they can find you. <laughs> yeah. And look, you know, I can already, I can already feel the criticism coming that somebody's going to say, oh, you know, you're being too critical of what she said in the 911 call. Just want to go back. Look, I, you know, 911 calls, people analyze them. They think they're important. They don't think they're important. You can take this for what it's worth. Like we said, you know, we've, we've been talking about the evidence for the last two episodes. Now we're talking about some of this stuff, some of the, you know, less concrete stuff. Take it for what it's worth. Think it's interesting if you want to, dismiss it if you want to. But to me, these are interesting things that Darley's saying. They seem to be revealing what is most important to Darley at the time. 
Right. And it doesn't stop there. When the police came in, Darlie was standing in the kitchen on the phone with 911, holding a towel to her injury on her throat. The police asked Darren to help Devin, which he did. They asked Darlie to help Damon, who was laying on his stomach close to her, bleeding from his back. Officers asked her to find something to apply pressure to the boy's back to stop the bleeding. Instead, she did nothing. She just stood there applying pressure to her own wound. And it's not as if she was in shock. In response to the officer's request, she told him that the person who committed the crimes was in the garage. Now, even if this were true, and even if Darley thought it was important to let the police know that, and she must have, as she'd already told them when they came to the house and told the 911 operator the same thing repeatedly, why did she make no efforts to help her kids? It's not like she's the one running out to the garage to stop this person. The police are there. They're there to apprehend the murderer. She is the mother. The only thing she can do, really, especially in her state of having, you know, her neck sliced, is maybe to put some pressure on her son's bleeding back. She's not going to be the one to run after a murderer. And we talked about this. When the police came back in, she was still standing there with, you know, the the towel on her own throat, not doing anything. And the police are like, help your son. Put some pressure on your son. Get a towel for your son. And And she just didn't do anything. And she just seemed like she was really, really wanted to emphasize that this intruder had come into the house and done all this. Now, Barbara Jovel testified that on June 7th, the day after the murders, she visited Darley in the hospital. She testified that when they were alone, Darley expressed her concern that the police would find her sex toys in the house while searching it. Barbara told her that given that she just lost her two sons, that should not be her concern. I mean, of all the things to worry about, it's not like sex toys point to being a murderer. You know, it's, it is it is a kind of a strange thing to focus on. Obviously, everyone thinks of things differently, but it'd be much different if she were telling Barbara, I'm afraid they're going to find my stash of ninja stars or knives, you know, <laughs> like not, yeah. not sex toys, like whatever. The sex toys didn't kill her children, but that was her concern and what she told Barbara the day after she just lost her sons. Now, at trial, it was revealed that during a conversation with a private investigator, Darley said not once, but six different times, quote, if I did it, I don't remember it. She would deny this on cross-examination. That's a strange thing to say. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very strange thing to say. To even, to even allow the possibility that maybe maybe you were involved in this is a is a very strange it's a very strange thing to say i don't i don't really know what to say about that um she did deny ever saying that on cross-examination don't know why this private investigator would make this up so with that i think we're going to wrap it up for today when we come back next week we're going to continue to talk about some of the the other things about darley's behavior that people have really focused on. We're going to talk about some some things Darley did after the case. We're going to talk about some FBI analysis uh, that was done on this case and what the FBI thought about what they were seeing at the crime scene. And we are going to talk about the infamous Silly String incident that many of you know about and that was an important part of this case. And then finally, we will talk about the theories. Was there an intruder? Did Darley do this? And if Darley did it, was she guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? Was there enough evidence to, to convict her? Did she get a fair trial? All that and more next week. Love to hear what you guys think. Shoot us an email, prosecutorspod at gmail.com, at prosecutorspod on all your favorite social media. Continue to, to check out the store. Pick up a onesie for your kids, a Team Owl t-shirt. All proceeds continue to go to support the Cold Case Research Institute. Because of you guys, we were able to make our first donation to them recently, and that will be supporting the good work that they are doing. So thank you, thank you, thank you for supporting our podcast and in turn supporting them. Well, Alice, is there anything else you want to say before we sign off for tonight? No, but um, it's always a joy getting to record with you, Brett. Well, thank you, Alice. It's always a joy to record with you as well. And it's a joy to bring this to you guys. I know this is a controversial one and people have very strong 
opinions about this case. We are very happy to hear what you have to say and continue this discussion. Head on over to the gallery on Facebook if you want to talk about this case. We are sure you have many thoughts. We will be back next week with the conclusion of this case. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutor. Superlative. Gonna run out eventually. There's just not gonna be enough words in the English language, yeah. or any language for that matter. Say, we've already to branched out to other Alice. languages, you know? <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I'll start saying bad things about you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat>